needs to be done every few years as part of home ownership. But that's our number one. The other thing we see in Utah a lot in our area is we'll see missing shingles. Does a missing shingles mean the roof needs to be replaced? Absolutely not. A roofer can go up there for a couple hundred bucks and put a couple of new shingles up there and it's as good as new. Okay, but they are something that is part of that protection that you have on your roof. So, and then uh, one of the most common things that has to do with roofs also has to do with drainage is gutter issues. Either they don't have adequate gutters or the gutters don't leave the water away from the house. Okay. Um, that's, that's pretty good. On older homes, you look at a home like this, it's a beautiful home. But I promise you, if every contractor in the world could build this house the way they want, these roofs would be perfectly flat on two sides. They wouldn't have all these little dormers and stuff. And so the kick out flashes, the ones that kick the moisture out so it doesn't end up going down to the wall. Those are that, but we find those missing. And on some of the older homes, they really should have been added. They weren't a part of it when the house was built. Does anyone have any questions on roofs while we're on this section? Next level. Let's start the back and then move forward. Go ahead. So, like, when we bought our house, for instance, um, there was there was snow on the roof, and the leaking there was a leak, and it couldn't be seen because it was frozen. So, um, like, how, is there a better way to inspect that, or is there a way that you necessarily inspect when there's snow? So, typically, if there's some there's situations like that. So as far as the home inspector goes, okay, if there's snow on the roof, then we are going to typically tell refer that off to a roofer. We're going to say to you that at the time of the inspection, the inspector was not able to either mount the roof. It, it was visually covered with snow. We're going to refer that off to a roofer. So we're going to send that to a specialist because in the winter time they're going to know what to do. And safely we cannot mount that roof. Um, so snow is a big, a big, especially this time of year, I guess, a couple months back, we get a lot of that. Now, sometimes companies will say, if that snow melts enough and we can safely mount that roof, um, and it's within our time, our schedule, we'll go back and, and walk that roof if we can. But if there's leaks, I mean, we're not all, all the time going to be able to see those leaks either. But we will be able to see at least the condition of the exterior of the roof. Second thing is if it's raining, we're not going to be able to mount that roof. Um, and also, if it's raining, or we, we're not going to be able to even get on the ladder uh, because of the safety of just mounting the ladder. So it's all about the conditions at the time, and we're going to refer that off to a roofer. On that direct question, there's a couple of roofing companies in Salt Lake that have a process um, and this is expensive, okay? But if they're, if your buyer absolutely wants to know the condition of that roof and it's got snow on it, they have a device, they'll go up there and they will steam off all the snow off of that roof and inspect it. The other thing is, is that, and it's not as good today as it was 15 years ago, they will go into the attic and look and see if they can see evidence in the attic that's roughly. But our modern homes, you can hardly access any of the attic because we all want to save energy. So we've stacked insulation 14 to 16 inches deep and the joists are only eight. Some houses 10 and the inspector actually can't cross that roof, walk across it because he can't see where the joists are and he's going to get hurt or he's going to damage your own. So attic access in the last seven or eight years has become almost uh, almost only being able to be done from the access opening with cameras and lights. Just so you know, very few times are you able to actually traverse an attic. But you can usually see if there's any roof leaks, so that helps. But uh, yeah, that's an issue with the snow. Um, and you had a question? Yeah, I don't understand what flashing is. Oh. <clears throat> flashing re real simply is, and it can be metal or plastic or uh, some sort of a rubberized deal, but a flashing is a little 
thing that they put around the pipe or the, or the uh, skylight to, to seal them against moisture. They're a moisture seal, so they're flashing in. Now, uh, kick out flashing is a metal device that's kind of L shaped that actually causes any moisture <coughs> to kick out off of the roof. In other words, it sticks out about yay far off of the roof. It kicks it out off the roof so it won't go down under the roof decking and that's the good inside. Okay. Any other questions on roof since we're here? <laughs> <laughs> on the exterior of the home. So this picture I thought was really great. We got this right from Aranachi. Is it kind of goes over exactly what um, an inspector is looking at when he's looking at the exterior of a home. So a lot of times, um, I, and my inspectors, and I have to apologize in advance, if, if an inspector shows up early to a home, um, typically it's because they're in between jobs. <laughs> and uh, they're, what they're going to do is they're going to inspect the exterior of the home so that they don't, you know, bug the, the people. And uh, a couple of my guys like to show up really early and do that. So we get we actually get complaints on that. Isn't that funny? Because they don't work on realtor time. Um, so, but we tell them fifteen minutes early is too is too early is not early enough. So, when I was learning to do inspections, which I don't do inspections, just so you know, but I, I went in and my brother, who was our lead inspector for a really long time, and he's been in the industry, he was a contractor for a really long time. When he was showing me how to do the inspections and how he did it. He took me around the property really slowly the first time, and it was an older home built in the 70s, I would say, and it needed some work. And uh, he walked me around the property, and I asked all of the first-time buyer questions I could possibly ask, because I didn't know. And he would say, you know, this is typical, concrete separates, this is a joist, this is this and this. And then I said, okay, and I was ready to go inside, and he said, no, that's not how you inspect the exterior. Now we walk around the other way, because what you just saw that way, we're going to see five or ten more things we didn't just see going the other way. Well, you go reverse. Yeah, you walk around it one way, and then you walk around it the other way. And so a lot of times when inspectors are doing a walkthrough with a client, if the client wants to do an exterior walkthrough, the inspector then gets another opportunity to walk that property again, and they may pick up things again. So that's why, you know, you were asking earlier, can they be there for the whole inspection? They can, but you you know you see things once, but if you do it again, you see it again. You see things differently, so it gives them the opportunity. But the exterior is going to go over the materials on the outside, the flashing trim, the doors, steps, stairs, porches, um, improper spacing between balusters, steps, uh, balconies, railings. Uh, typically, it's going to they're going to ch check an, a representative number of windows. So what that means is when an inspector goes in, they have about three hours to do that property inspection, two and a half, three hours. They don't go uh, generally and check every single window and open it. Did you know that? They go in and they check a representative number of windows, typically windows that are accessible. Um, if there's a bed in front of a window, uh, they don't climb on the person's bed and check that window, okay? They don't do things like that. Um, they're gonna they're gonna note make notice of the vegetation around the property. They're gonna make notice of the uh, the grading around the foundation that might affect the stu the structure, and that is especially due to moisture intrusion. Just um, and describe the exterior wall coverings. This part is so important because we run into this, especially now that winter has come and now it's going. We our phones will start ringing because. People that have had home inspections in the winter, the ground was solid, there was no rain, it was just snow, so the snow's starting to melt, they're gonna start turning their sprinkler systems on. And when we're inspecting in the winter time, a lot of time the snow is piled up against the house, we can't exactly see exactly what the grading is, but we make a note of it. And negative grading against a house, what, what you come to find is not a positive thing. Whether it be decorative or not, it can cause extreme moisture intrusion, which causes damage into the basements and things of that nature. And so I'm going to turn this over to Al because I think this part's really important as far as it goes on your guys' end, especially when you're listing a home. 
um, it could help prevent the calls after the inspection or, you know, when you're listing the house, you could say you might want to correct that. It may come up in the inspection. So I'm going to have Al talk about this for a quick minute. What's negative grading? Yeah, that's exactly uh, what he's going to tell you about. Guess what? Real estate agents should not be doing home inspections when they walk through with their buyer. They're just things that you notice that you sh that you should talk about, but you shouldn't try to be the home inspector, okay? Because it'll get you, first off, you get them to walk when they don't really have to, because you said something, and you said it in a, in a real estate agent's um, vocabulary when it really should have been said in an inspector's vocabulary, which whether you like it or not, many times the inspectors are a lot softer about certain issues than you are as an agent because you don't know that that doesn't mean anything at all. But there's one thing you can do on a home inspection on a, when you're showing a home as an agent. First thing you do is don't go, oh my God, look at that. If you see something you think is wrong, keep your mouth shut until you do a little bit more investigation. I'm trying to tell you how not to lose a deal, okay? Uh, and with the same thing with an inspector. Anybody ever see a TV show called The... Uh, it was called, it was a home inspector show, <coughs> Homes on Homes, but it was home inspector and you are always seeing him boys like this. Oh my God, you guys got a real problem here. <laughs> because it was a TV show. <laughs> if an inspector said that to one of your buyers, I would hope you'd be armed <laughs> and I hope you'd react appropriately. But the point I'm getting at here is the number one problem in homes today is grading. That's the number one defect on homes. And the prettier and more beautiful the home is, and the more they've tried to make it look like a garden, sometimes those are the ones that have the problem. But you can walk around the house and see if there's slope store in the house. You don't have to tell your buyers, but you have to know that when the report comes back, it's going to be on the report. So you better know what to do about it. And the best thing to do about it is to, uh, in, in minor cases, you can say, you know, all, all they have to do is just kind of build the soil up here a little bit. If it's really bad, I'll bet you if you walk in the house and you look close enough, you'll see there's a reason why you have to do that. So you need to get a, a landscaper out there just to tell you what to do. Okay, but that is a number one problem. So grading. Grading costs insurance companies, or you'd think it costs insurance companies, costs more insurance claims that they deny than any other moisture intrusion in the house. Because remember, homeowners insurance only covers things that are a result of the house structure on the interior and the roofs. Okay? But if you've got a sprinkler that's leaking and flooding a house, most Insurance policies will not cover that. It's almost always a grading. Enough? Did that answer your question well, so, on negative grading? So basically, the grading is the soil on the outside of the house. It should be angled out from the house, not going into the house. Mm -hmm. okay. An inch, about, it should drop an inch about every um, 10 feet, an inch or two. In other words, it should have just a very slight slope away from the house. So, but it is the number one problem oh, yeah. with houses, but uh, and it looks pretty sometimes. And also with basement windows, as it's you know, yeah, well, that's all sure part. the soil is, yeah, yeah. So. Oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 So how far out should that the grade go? Because a lot of times you, as you figure out, and you have all the pretty yeah. landscape. Mm -hmm. So, how far away from the house should you have that positive grade? It's supposed to be 10 feet. And but if you get some hillside properties, you're going to see it doesn't won't go ten feet. So a contractor, and I say, not negligence on their part is just not cost effective. Should have put some sort of a drainage system in because if you got a slope from, let's say, I don't know if any of you guys uh, sell up on the hill up here. Uh, if that slope comes down and you've only got about five feet or six feet and then there's your foundation and so you really can't get a, a good positive slope away from it. There's a drainage system that can be installed that will. I had that issue in Alpine a couple 
years ago that they decided that, that is a challenge, and, the, and, the, and a lot of builders didn't put them in. So, if you're having an issue, it's time to fix it. Any other questions on the exterior or exterior foundation or that jazz? Okay. Uh, basement foundation, crawl spaces, <laughs> and structure. Uh, the foundation, basement, crawl space. Um, the uh, the inspector will, he's going to indicate whether there's active water penetration, wooden contact with or near soil, uh, movement such as sheetrock cracking, concrete cracking, bricks that are cracked, out of square door frames, unleveled floors, um, notching and boring of framing members that may, in the inspector's opinion, present a structural or safety concern. So. Again, an inspector is a generalist. So if he sees a crack, because my brother always told me there's three things in life that are inevitable. Death, taxes, and your concrete cracking. Because we had this beautiful concrete laid, it cost us thousands of dollars, right? We moved into our house, and all of a sudden, here came this big crack. And I was like, oh my God. And he said, he's a contractor, concrete's gonna crack. And I'm like, great. So, but, then he explained to me the types of cracks. And so as a generalist, he's gonna go through, he's gonna make sure that those cracks are not um, hindrance to the foundation or are they typical cracking for that property, the age of the property and those kinds of things. So again, if it is something that looks like it is of grave concern, he's gonna refer you to a structural engineer. Um, as far as, and I'll have Al go into more detail about that. As far as crawl spaces go, there's a couple limitations when it comes to an inspector getting into a crawl space. One, we, crawl spaces aren't as typical around this area as they are maybe down south um, in, or on the west coast. Uh, we do run into them every now and then. Um, so a lot of times uh, the reason why inspectors may not be able to access crawl spaces is because vegetation's grown over the entrance. Um, the entrance may be too small for an inspector. We have uh, some of our inspectors are tall, big guys, and some are, you know, tall, skinny guys, so they can get in there. Um, another reason is, is we don't know what's going on in that crawl space. There could be, um, you know, dead animals in there. Um, they have to typically put on a almost it looks like a hazmat suit that they have to put on and, and the neighbors sometimes think what's going on in there then too. So they actually have this new thing out. Um, we, we actually got to experience it this, this last week when we were in Las Vegas for an inspector, inspector conference and it's called the Crawlbot. And it's just a, a little remote control car almost with a camera and uh, you control it. It goes into crawl spaces and the, in, the company that does this their whole premise behind this is to get inspectors out of crawl spaces completely. And so uh, it's something that, you know, we, we might see in the in our market here eventually. Like I said, in California, they've got it now. So we'll probably see it in about 18 months, hitting our market a little bit more. But uh, it's um, we, we don't encourage our inspectors to go into crawl spaces because of the health issues. If there's any kind of open or live wires down there, we don't know about. And if there's any active water, or anything we don't know about there, now we put them in in uh, in harm's way, and we don't want to do that. And a lot of times, there's not a lot going on in those crawl spaces anyway, so other than structural issues. So, when, uh, some people say, "Well, so what?" So your inspector mm -hmm. let him crawl in there and get muddy and wet. Well, that's why they make puddles. No, that's a joke. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the safety issue is a big deal in crawl spaces. Uh, if there is actually dampness on the ground and you go into a crawl space, most of the older homes, older crawl spaces, no, I'm not talking about a new one, older one, there's wiring down there that's not, that's got what we call floating splices. They're spliced with duct tape or, I mean, an electrician tape around them, but they're not in a junction block. And if you were to come in contact with that, there's potential for electrocution. I went under one home one time and I started, I used to crawl because I was young and dumb, and I thought the uh, uh, 
two hundred vacuum when we got two hundred and fifty dollars for home inspection. Uh, that that was worth me uh, risking my health. But I got in and I started looking around and I saw I counted at least seven cat carcasses in different stages of decomposing, okay? And I said, uh, no, I'm not going to be further. We don't know. I don't know what it was, but if it did that to the cats, what might it do to me? That was the first thing I did. The real estate agent, who was a rather small lady, uh, said, what? I my coveralls. Happy to let you put on the coveralls. Here's my light. Here's my gloves. Here's my goggles. You can go out down there, but <clears throat> I have to tell you, I don't know what killed those cats. I can see a lot. It was a wide open, pretty wide open foundation, but it was only about that tall. 18 inches is a very minimum you can crawl in, and that's stupid if it's dirt to be crawling with your face. Within 18 inches of the dirt foundation that's been there 100 years or whatever. But that's neither here nor there. But we could see pretty much the whole foundation just by doing this. And the agent said, I would risk my life to go in there. She, I should. Don't do it. Don't worry about it. But I just want you to know there are things down there. Uh, right now, uh, if where do you think, when they do a flip, now a flip's a bad word. There's a good way to call a flip. Very nice way, it's called recently renovated. And boy, if you tell your buyers, look at this one's been recently renovated, and in your true heart of hearts, believe that's a good thing. It can be, but not always, because recently renovated means flip. Any other term? We don't use the word slip because it's a four letter word, but um, we saw one not too long ago where we went, tried to get in the crawl space and almost clear up to the, and it was too small to crawl in anyway, it was only about 14, 18 inches, almost up to the joist was filled with the old subfloor, drywall, everything that was ripped out of that house. They ripped the subfloor out. And then everything they ripped out of there, they just threw underneath. Really? And that's an example of an exaggerated example, but it's not uncommon to go in there and see a whole bunch of old baseboard stuff down under there, or old carpet down under there. And so that's a haven for insects, rodents, and uh, bacteria. So crawlspace well, are. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what FLIP stands for, but I think it has something to do with make as much money without spending very much to do it. I don't know what it is. Anyway, uh, we all know crawl spaces are yucky dirty. Most inspectors will access yucky dirty crawl spaces to a limit. Okay. So most of them, most of them, most home inspectors will go down into the crawl space and they'll go as far as they can go before they run into debris and moisture and junk. And uh, so just, just don't be upset if they say that they have limited view in a crawl space. Now, if I see a problem, I might, a potential problem, I might risk a, a little bit more. And it's not the getting dirty. It's, it's the other things that are in the process. Oh, by the way, <laughs> another thing that flippers like to do, God, I hate talking about it, on crawl spaces, is they're going to have a carpet man guy come in and do re carpet the whole place, right? Because carpet is a cheaper way to hide all of it, make it look pretty, okay? And guess what the carpet guy does? The carpet's right over the access. To the crawl space. And he says to the contractor, I can go for another $125, I can cut that out. And, and you know, what does the contractor say? I'm not going to spend 125 bucks. So, you'll see that by the way. 
attic excesses. I can't tell you how many recently renovated homes we've gone into where they put a nice, beautiful new ceiling in and they just <clears throat> put it over the attic access because they got in it and they saw all they wanted to see. They don't really care if anybody else ever gets up in there again. So maybe they saw some things up there they didn't want anybody to see. I don't know. I wouldn't say that is probably the case because most of the renovators in Utah are very good, by the way, just so you know. But there's still a few out there that are. Any questions on foundations? Cracks? I notice that this um, sun crest foundations of those homes because they're built on a sand on the leftover of the mountain and they should be built on uh, Surprisingly enough, in sunset, yes, yeah. there's a lot of cracked foundations. They don't mean a thing. There, there are a lot of those cracks. I, I've been on 12, 15 year old homes up there, have been there, and they aren't showing any more movement. They've settled all they're going to settle. But we don't know that for sure, do we? So we have a structural contractor or engineer. We don't always recommend a structural engineer because a structural contractor will go up there for a couple hundred bucks and look at it. Uh, a structural engineer will go up and Lowest price I've seen. Well, I got one that'll do it for about two fifty. But most of them will write a letter of serviceability for about five hundred to seven hundred fifty dollars. But if you get up on Suncrest, you know what they say: more expensive homes, they can pay me more money. They get more money. They're not that more. expensive, really. But really, what it is it's in relationship to something in uh, 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 down in the West Valley or. Rose Park or someplace. Yeah, it's more expensive. Uh, yeah, but don't be so afraid of those cracks up there. But let your inspector tell you whether he thinks you ought to have them checked out. You know, don't just go up there and say, well, some guy named Al said they don't mean anything. Most of them don't, but some do. Okay. Some of those cracks are still moving, so to speak. They'll be always there. But a lot of them won't ever move again. They've gone as far as they're going to go. Um, heating. So the heating system, we use normal operating controls describing the energy source, heating method, um, um, and report as in need of repair on the heating systems that do not operate uh, and that are deemed accessible. So. We, there was a comment that was made a couple weeks ago to us about a certain brand of thermostats that was out there and we, that were bad and I'm like, I've never heard of that. But we go into a home and the inspector has a particular protocol that they, they check the heating system with and in the spring and summertime when they're checking the heating system, they're che typically checking the air conditioning system too. In the winter, we can't check that air conditioning system because of the temperature outside and running the risk of ruining that condensing unit on that air conditioner. Um, so things like that. But what they're looking at in the heating system and with the new heating systems, I put this diagram in here because this is more of a, this is a little bit newer, what the newer heating systems look like and the things that you're looking at for them. Uh, the one that when I went out on a home inspection, with one of my inspectors, he was showing me the flame. You could actually see the flame on this one. And it was like pure blue. And, or what was it? Was it orange or blue? Well, it was blue, it was perfect. Right, it was orange. Yellow and it was yellow and orange. Might need some news. Yeah, and he said, what do you, what's wrong with this? Well, I don't know anything, I didn't know anything about it. And the flame, he's like, this heater needs to be serviced. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is it was my niece's house at the time. So I, I went up to my niece and I'm like, you need to get your furnace serviced. Your flame is orange. She's like, what does that mean? And I'm like, I don't know, but I just know you need to get it serviced. <laughs> so, but a couple of things that in layman terms that I've learned about the furnace system is, uh, or especially the, the heating, the heater downstairs is, is that that filter is there. It's it's there because it's holding back all the debris and the dirt and stuff that goes into the combustion chamber and things like that to make sure that that stays clean. It's not so much to keep that dirt out of the 
what's coming through your furnace and up through your ducts and stuff, it's to keep that chamber and stuff clean. And that's why it's so important to keep that changed, um, which is something that I, I don't think a lot of people that maybe you're buying homes, first time buyers especially know. Um, I've always, I always told my husband, I'm like, how, how often are you supposed to change that? Every month, every three months? I don't know, put a note on it. You do it. And so um, I always thought it was so that the dust wouldn't come up through the vents and things like that. But yet on my ceiling fan at the end of the summer, which goes all year long, I'm like, why is there so much dust on my ceiling fan? Um, and so it started to make sense once I learned a little bit more about heating systems. So, but as far as in a real estate transaction, um, we actually had an agent out of Davis County ask us to sit down and talk to her about different um, furnaces and things like that. And so I thought it was best that Al talk to her about it because a lot of things that we were running into as far as inspectors go was the size of piping that contractors or people that were maybe putting their own furnaces in, especially with water heaters too, they weren't putting the right size pipe on the, the furnaces and that was, we were having to pull, bring that up and um, Questar was having to get called on a couple of them and then how do we check for carbon monoxide, uh, things of that nature and so I kind of like to have Al talk about this part of it because he's out there in the trenches and he can tell you what, what the inspector is doing, what they're pointing out about heaters, the typical lifespan of a furnace um, and also as far as the piping goes and then when, when we have to contact Questar and why Questar is important. One tip though for you, um, when you're putting homes under contract, lately we're coming across, across a lot of vacant properties. Um, so one of the things that we typically ask is whether the water, the gas, and the electricity are on. And you don't know that as a buyer's agent. A lot of the time when you go into the home, they might, you know, turn the water on or flip the lights on and off, uh, but you don't, you're not typically checking the gas. It might have been warm. We hear that a lot from the buyer. Well, it was warm. Um, so when, when you're having an inspection done, the only way to get a full, complete inspection is to make sure that all of those utilities are on inside the home. And one of the things that we run across a lot is that the water isn't on because it's winter and they turn that water off to the home because they don't want those lines to freeze. But one of the important things is when you do get that water turned on either by the city or the homeowner or the somebody goes out and turns that water on, they have to make sure that pilot light to the water heater's lit. Um, otherwise, we can't check that water heater. Um, if the pilot light isn't lit, uh, the water heater doesn't heat up and you don't get you know, the proper testing on that. So that's one really big thing as far as that goes. And so that's just kind of a tip when it comes to that. They confuse me on this furnace because in my home there is a heat return and the furnace holds the air through there through the filter and holds it right back into my home. And the combustion air actually comes from outside there to cool air in there. But what you just said is that's what was filtered and that's not how it is on my furnace. They're filtering air in my house and comes back in my house. Okay. Yeah, just to make it. She really wasn't referring to combustion air. Combustion air is, is completely different than what she was talking about. And you're right. Combustion air is that any gas burning appliance needs <coughs> oxygen and air. And so they usually put a little grill on the outside and they run a pipe or they pan it over so that there's a actually cold air coming into your basement. That's where your client starts to fill up in there and don't yeah. let them do that. Yeah, don't put a pillow up in there unless you want to. Your family wake up dead sometime. And uh, boy, that's no fun to wake up dead, I promise you. I've heard it. But anyway, anyway, that's combustion air. What Jolene's talking about is the main purpose for this filter is to keep this clean because as the air comes through here, it has to pass over the combustion chamber, over the heated part to get the heat, and then it passes the heat out to your house. A secondary benefit of it is, is that it keeps the air a little bit cleaner in your house, okay? But that's not its main purpose. Its main purpose is to keep the dust off this, because if these overheat, that's when they crack. And when they crack, burned gases turn into something called carbon monoxide, and that can be an issue, okay? That's what she was talking about. 
But yes, it does filter the air going into your house. That's just not the primary purpose. That's a secondary purpose. The primary purpose is to keep this from getting overheated and cracking. But we all thought for a hundred years that the whole purpose of that filter is to keep the air clean out. And it does do that, but the biggest concern is here. So let's say it's a double concern, all right? Oh, by the way, on combustion, or, or not on combustion air, but on carbon monoxide, here's what's happening <clears throat> on homes. They go in and they put a brand new medium efficient or mid efficient, they call it, furnace in, not a high efficient. In other words, not we're not talking about the ones that use a plastic vent pipe on them. You say, how can they put plastic vent pipe on a furnace on my old one if I touch that uh, flue pipe, I'd burn myself. Well, that's because of the way they designed them to save energy that isn't um, 175 to, to 300 degree temperature going out there anymore. It's about 120 to 140 degree temperature going out. So that's how high efficiency you could use a plastic pipe. But they'll go in and they'll put the mid one in. How do you know if it's a mid? When you open the cover on the front, there's a little fan going zzz zzz zzz. Early years, they used to have a little damper. When you opened it up, that damper would open up when the furnace was on. And what it was trying to do is to, when the furnace wasn't working, that's what that damper was for. When the furnace wasn't working, all the warm air wasn't going out the flue, okay? And then they came up with a little recirculating fan so that when the furnace wasn't working, that there'd be a baffle shut off and that fan would be shut off and you wouldn't be losing heat up to your flue. Okay. But they go and they put the one in with the fan, right? And there's a water heater that taps into that same flue pipe, that metal flue pipe. So they just cut a hole in that new flue pipe. Flue pipe they flare out the edges of that water heater flue and they stick it inside there so it'll keep working. And water heaters will not vent properly that way. <clears throat> and so they get what they call carbon monoxide spillage. In other words, when the furnace is working, all is wonderful. But in the summertime, when you use your water heater and the furnace isn't running, carbon monoxide can spill into your house. So here's what Questar's doing. They're going out, they find it, they red tag your water heater. Tell you that you have to replace that line with a four inch flute and you have to put a proper key in there. You can't cut a hole in it because it's a double deal. And if you cut a hole in it, you have to cut a hole in the inside too. And now you've lost the seal of it and the potential for carbon monoxide or for uh, burned gases are so that they'll get into the living area instead of going straight up. So if a home, don't get mad at a home inspector. If he goes out there and says it has a three inch vent and it's a 40,000 BTU, that's a couple of the, the red flags. It's a 40,000 BTU water heater. It's got a three inch flue on it and it has potential for uh, carbon monoxide. Because is it better for you to have your seller go ahead and have somebody come out and upgrade it to four inch or have? Press star red tag, and then they can't use the water heater. Then everybody, the buyer, someone that gets the red tag, usually, and they're really mad because nobody said it. So uh, that's an issue right now is, is those four inch flues. And it's brand new with Quest Star. They just said they've had enough of them. the people having carbon monoxide coming in the house from those uh, temporary corrections, they call them. They don't call them incompetent installers and temporary fixes. So just want to cover that for you. What age of homes are we talking about? Any home that had uh, probably anything from, I'm going to give you an age, uh, 95 or 6 on, uh, older. 95 or 4. Older. Now, not all of them. Because remember, back in the mid 90s, you could have the old gravity type furnace, the old one that didn't have the little blower fan, or you could have the blower fan, or you could have 
the new Cadillac high efficiency lights. So I, at exact ages, it's crazy for me to tell you that, but I, I'm going to say that. Okay? Anyway, you see a three inch flute on a water heater instead of a four inch, you might be a little bit suspicious. Do you have to say anything to your buyers? No. That's why you hire a home inspector. But when the report comes back, don't say, what a stupid home inspector. That's been working that way for, the seller will say that. Been working that way for 30 years. Yeah. Before you put that in the furnace. In. Okay. All right. All right. All right, fine. Any other questions on meeting? I'll get really passionate about that. Oh, by the way, I am that, and I apologize. <laughs> and then I don't apologize. He loves plumbers and workers. Uh, and then the cooling system, we're going to check the central cooling equipment using normal operating controls. Of course, this, again, depends upon the exterior temperature. Um, as far as cooling systems go also, that here in Utah, we have the swamp coolers or evaporative coolers. Um, a lot of times, they're, the only thing that they can check on those is um, from the interior controls. Um, you know, that in... Again, that's... Can you hear the pump? And can you hear the blow? Yeah. That's all I can check in the wintertime because they're all covered, covered and vented. By the way, that's the thing that costs a thousand plus dollars when, when your brother-in-law comes in and turns the air conditioner on in July or in January because there's 50 people in the house and it, it got too hot. And he decided that he could cool that house off so everybody would be comfortable. So he turns the air conditioner in January, and that's the thousand dollar piece that ceases up and fails. And that's why inspectors are not supposed to test them at any temperature that hasn't been sustained at 60 degrees for at least 24 hours. And that's why you'll see if an inspector say, I can't check the air conditioner today. And then you get mad and say, I never heard of such a thing. Yeah. Um, any questions on the cooling system? I mean, it's pretty straightforward as far as that goes. Um, Al, do you want to comment anything on um, where cooling systems sit on the exterior of the house, such as a concrete pad or anything like that? Well, yeah, usually, usually they try to set this unit in a location that's not unpretty. In other words, they didn't want to put it on the front of the house. How many of you have seen them on the front of the house? Yeah, because that was the easiest way for them to run these pipes, these tubes back to the furnace. But normally they try to sit them on the side of the house. But they, they will, some of them will put them on concrete, some of them will put them on plastic. They should generally be level. A slight being out level isn't a big deal. But when they get like that, the parts are just, especially if it's got uh, the old uh, compressor systems. Uh, the parts are all designed to work in a pretty much a straight up position and then sometimes they get over here. Now you get the oil that will mix with the Freon or it's not Freon anymore. It's, we'll just call it refrigerant. And so that's why they have to be level. You don't cover these. You don't go down and buy a swamp cooler cover and cover these in the winter. Unless you disconnect the electrical right up here. And so your brother-in-law can't come in and turn the air conditioner on and then cause it to overheat and damage itself. So you don't cover those. They're not designed to be covered. You do not plant vegetation all the way around them to make them look so people can't see them. 12 inches. What do you see there? That, that. If that has a solid side like this over there, that's perfectly okay. But if it has the louvers, you have that. Uh, I can't tell from this one, but they're supposed to be at least, I th most manufacturers say at least eight inches from the actual building on the back. Pretty straightforward. Good. Everybody knows about cooling now? Something about it? <laughs> Plumbing. Um, determine the report uh, in the report whether the water supply is public or private. We don't really do that. You guys have already got that in your MLS reports. 
Um, we'll identify the location of the main water shutoff valve, inspect the heating equipment, um, energy sources, the water pressure um, relief valves, we'll inspect the toilets, the sinks, the tubs. Um, this is actually a pretty good diagram of everything that, that is inspected in the house. Um, one thing I do want to, I want to clarify is that as far as the water shutoff valve goes, um, we don't go in and actually turn that water shutoff valve unless we have written consent from the homeowner or a representative of that. And the reason why is because it's not an, a, an item that's used on a daily use. So um, we actually have um, a situation where a gentleman purchased a condo. They, he was going to remodel the kitchen. It was noted in the report that the, that the water shutoff valve was operable because obviously the water was on. Um, but it was an old, it was an older style water valve. With the turn knob on. The old ones. If your water valve has a turn knob, that's the old ones. Once you open them, if you don't close them every year, and open them every year, which nobody does, they will get to the point where they will not function. Yeah, so he had, once he moved into his condo, um, the contractor came in to shut that valve off and the valve wasn't working. So, came back to us, asked us why we didn't note that in our report, and nicely tried to explain to him, you know, we, we don't test that, we don't turn the water off, um, and we don't turn it on for any reason, because it's already on in the property. That's why when we, why I was saying about vacant properties, make sure all the utilities are already turned on, because we, it's just too much liability in that aspect of it. So, um, if it's not a an item that's used on a daily use typically, then you don't test it for function, especially the water shut off valve, especially if the property already has the water turned on. But we are going to identify the location of it for your customer. Um, uh, we've had several instances, uh, especially with toilets. Um, we flush them several times. We've had people ask us, you know, um, we don't we don't put toilet paper down them. Um, we don't typically utilize the facilities unless need be, but we've had people that have moved into the homes and have, you know, used the bathroom for sources that, you know, for reasons and the toilets have plugged and they've asked us why that didn't show up and it's because we don't, we just flush them. We flush the toilets. <laughs> so, um, but these are, these are the items that are tested when doing a, a plumbing, when we're checking the plumbing. Um, the other thing is, is this is where most of your water and leak conditions are going to show up. And so when the inspector is checking the um, underneath the kitchen sink, uh, especially when you're doing a listing, it might be a good idea for you guys to tell your listing customers when the inspector is about ready to come in, clear away some of the stuff underneath the sink. Um, home inspectors typically won't, they'll go in, they'll open up underneath the sink, but they won't move around any items. We don't touch people's belongings. Uh, that's just not part of it. That's why it's the non-invasive inspection. But if the we, while we're running that water in the kitchen sink, uh, while we're running the disposal, if there's any leaks or whatnot, if there's any water damage that's underneath the kitchen sink, we want to be able to see that. Um, that way we can note that. So when they move out and then they move in and they see that there's been some water damage there, or previous water damage, they're not surprised when that's happened. On a sideline? Yes. A uh, couple of uh, plumbing. Uh, I don't know if you're going to get to the waste part of plumbing, but we cannot effectively, within the scope of home inspection, do a full waistline inspection. Okay, when I say we can't run uh, 75 gallons of water down the bathtub to make sure that that drain doesn't leak under unusual conditions okay and so a lot of times we'll have drains back up and you say well why didn't you check because we just there's no we don't have a facility to run uh, that much water down there uh, we don't scoop the sewer lines although that's a new service that's coming from almost all of home inspectors mm -hmm. we don't have it yet but we have someone available to you that can scope a sewer line Newer homes, yeah, likeliness of having a sewer line issue is is fairly minimal, but it can happen. But on these homes in Sugar House, 
these homes where there's a lot of mature trees, your buyers should spend the two hundred dollars or whatever it is they should, honestly, and have a sewer line scope. Because if they don't, and they do have a problem, depending on how scrupulous the repairman is, it could be anywhere from two to thirty-five, forty thousand dollars. Okay, so do it. Just tell you people if you're in an older neighborhood, let's go ahead and have the sewer scope. A couple hundred bucks. Another thing, Jolene said we don't tell you if it's uh, uh, private or public uh, water. More importantly, we don't tell you if it's private or public sewer. And I just sat in on a case uh, uh, where the attorneys were telling us that the home inspector went out. There's two great big manholes in the street in front of that property. And to him, that probably meant what? City sewer? Pretty good chance that's what it was. Well, in some areas, they should be hooked up to the city sewer, but they're not. They're hooked up to septic tanks. And there is no way. No way that a home inspector would probably be able to know that. And in this particular case, the home seller did not know that his water was not hooked up. His sewer was not hooked up to the city. Well, they should have emptied it out. You know, it didn't have a problem. Septic tanks can go for years before they need to be pumped. Okay. But they owned the home for seven or eight years and did not know they weren't hooked up to the sewer that they had a septic tank. Pretty unusual. All right? Were they paying the sewer bill? <laughs> Some of them don't know. Water bill? Some places include the sewer in it. Oh, but no, by the way, that was part of the case too. They had been paying for city sewer all along. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. I, they were telling me about the case. Well, here's what the inspector did. Totally innocent. He put on his report. Water line is public. Sewer is public. And so what the court was trying to say is that the home inspector had a percentage of liability here because he said it was public. But all the evidence he had, all the evidence the homeowners had, said it was public, and it wasn't. So they don't know, and sometimes the seller don't know. So uh, I just want to tell you about that. I'm drained. So our company no longer tells you whether the sewer is public or private. They just don't do it anymore. Okay? And they probably won't do whether the water is public or private. Who really needs to know? You know if you're out in the country, <laughs> you probably got a well. So it's kind of an unnecessary thing when we put it. Yeah. Was that house, was it in a city? or was City, it, yes. It was in the yeah. city. Oh. Yeah, it was and did a, they know what the neighbors were doing? They were all, the, all the neighbors were hooked up to sewer. The city sewer. But when they would post hook, previous owners years ago, when it was time to hook up to the sewer, they either had an option and didn't take it, whatever, but they were being charged for sewer. Yeah, that's going on right now in Big Cottonwood Canyon. They put in sewer, but some of the cabins aren't hooked up to it, so you can come out. Yep, and the canyon has sewer, but a lot of the houses up there still have. And the truth is, the inspector can't know, and the inspector shouldn't have to go and check yeah. public and utility records. And by the way, on that one that went to court, if anyone would have called the city and said, are they hooked up to sewer? What do you think the city would have said? Yes. Absolutely. We've been collecting from us for seven or eight years. <laughs> I just want to that. We can't know everything. Any other questions about plumbing? Um, okay. Electrical. Um, so we're going to check the, the, the service main, the, uh, the panel boards. We're going to make sure nothing is, is double tapped. 
um, the circuit breakers. We're going to check for grounding. We're going to check the representative number of switches, um, lighting fixtures, um, fault, uh, AFCIs, GFCIs. Um, this is kind of a dumbed down way of knowing what a GFCI is, if you didn't know this. Um, so if I have a toaster and I decide I want to hold my toaster over the sink, put my toast in, push the button, and drop the toaster in the water, and it's flipped into a GFCI, it'll short the, to short the toaster out. Bam. That's how easy it is. I had no idea. Um, so that's that's the Jolene Lehman way of telling you how that works. Um, um, if the GFCIs were not pro pro properly installed and did not operate properly, um, evidence of arcing or excessive heat, service entrance conductors, and condition of the conductor general, absence of smoke or carbon monoxide alarms and detectors. Um, electrical is probably one of the bigger, I would say, um, items that we get like callbacks on or questions on, things of like that. This is one of the one of the items that is, for lack of better words, invasive that we do because we will do as long as it's safe. We will um, remove the the panel of the electrical box as long as it's. Um, the cover, sorry, the, the cover of the electrical panel, as long as it's safe to do so. Um, and there's a couple of different types of electrical systems that uh, are part of standard operating procedures that we cannot test, and I'll, let, I'll go over those. But um, as far as it goes here, uh, the, the part I, want, I really want to point out to you is um, just like the windows, when I was talking about how we check a representative number of the windows, it's the same thing with outlets. So we don't go through the house and check every single outlet in that house for two reasons. One, there just isn't enough time. And number two, if something is plugged into an outlet, um, we don't unplug it and plug our, our tester into it. So again, we don't, that, that would be invasive. That would be removing somebody's property. We don't do that. That's just part of the standard operating procedures. So we check a, a, a representative number and I would say when, when I'm saying representative number, Al, what, what percentage would you say that is? Uh, in an unfinished, unfurnished home, it's almost always 100% agree. In a furnished home, uh, depending on if somebody's living there and they've got everything plugged into everything, it probably could be as, as, as little as 20% of the outlet is going to check. Again, if, if furniture is covering it, things are plugged into it, things of that nature, then we, again, we, we don't have the opportunity to, to do that. Um, but a couple things that just uh, on more of a, uh, this could be on a buyer or a seller for you guys, just looking forward to when you're representing your customers, um, the type of electrical systems and um, things that most commonly come up, probably this probably came up on your list of top 10, uh, come up when it comes to electrical and home inspections um, are the type of systems that home inspectors don't typically inspect because of the type of system that they are and the ones that we usually are are or say definitely need to have somebody come out and look at it. A couple of things that I want to tell you as an agent. If the report shows more than one minor electrical <coughs> issue when and you, you should probably have the entire system checked out by an electrician. I promise you if if you go through a house that's supposed to have grounded electrical and you find two or three that are ungrounded, what else did they not do right when they finished the basement or they added that? Okay? Um, so my in our reports, a lot of what we will say, recommend that you have a qualified electrician inspect the entire system. But what do you do? Not just you, but in general, the a real the real estate guy does want to pay for an electrical checking. All right? So they will call up an electrician and say, well, we just have this couple outlets in the basement that aren't grounded. You know, could you just come out and tell us what it's going to take to fix those? And guess what? That is, that may not be the whole problem, okay? Now, Jolene mentioned that there's a couple of panels that we cannot remove. And 
agents sometimes get quite kind of upset when we tell them we can't remove that panel cover. One, if it's painted shut. Now, if the agent gets mad, then the agent must also be the person that owns the house that we're inspecting. Because they're the only people that can give us permission to take a panel off a wall that's been painted over. Okay? Because guess what happens when we take it off? And we have actually had a unreasonable, in my opinion, seller want us to come in and paint that entire room. Oh my gosh. Because we do it. Now, been doing it for a long time. Occasionally, you can see that if you just take your carpet knife and score it real carefully, you can get it off. And if that's the case, we typically will do that. All right. The other thing is, is if it's a panel made by Zinsco, Z-I-N-S-C-O. If we say it has a Zinsco panel, do not panic. Do not tell your buyers that they can't buy that house because it has an obsolete, outdated panel that's had all kinds of lawsuits over. Get a qualified electrician to come out and check it out because the good ones are good. But they had enough of them. But in our industry, we're not allowed to take that panel off. And our company has a policy that our inspectors are definitely not supposed to remove that panel. What's wrong with the panel? I mean, when you read the panel, if it works fine, it works fine. Uh, one of the issues is they don't always trip. But the biggest thing is, is when you take the panel off, the cover off, those breakers are not anchored properly. And they fly out. And you get what you call a flash. And I talked to an old guy that's been inspecting for years, he's been one of my instructors for years. He said, You can't believe how many complaints I get because when I go to take the panel off, I've got this kit that I carry in my box. It includes a jacket, gloves, and a big heavy shield that I put in front of my face. Scary. Yeah, but he showed us the scars from before he started using that. Zinsco panels cannot, should be removed by a knowledgeable electrician. And kind of like the plumbers crawl in the crawl spaces, or the electrician gets a flashback, or who cares? Not really. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we hit one not very long ago. Not only was it a Zinsco panel, but the bottom five breakers were, and Zinsco's have colored <coughs> breakers on them, big colored grit breakers. Okay, you can tell breakers, and they're instead of the breakers uh, being up and down, they're sideways, which is not a sign that there's in scope because some are. But anyway, the bottom five were brand new breakers. Now, there's not very many breakers that are compatible with the Zinsco box. But I don't know which ones they are. So when we wrote it up, and all we said was, don't panic. Just get an electrician come out here. And if he says it's all okay, not a problem, please ask him to write on his invoice that he said that that Zutsko panel and everything about it was okay. And just in case he was wrong. But usually if a qualified electrician comes out and looks at it and says it's all safe, great. But do we want your buyer to pull that panel off? No. Cover? Because you do. You put your electrical panel cover off. In it. So that's Zinsco. Another one is called Federic, Federal Pacific or Pacific. They have a similar issue. So we will not remove those. Okay? They have one called Push-O-Matic. Have you ever seen one when you reset the breaker, you just push the breaker in? Push-O-Matic, the problem with the Push-O-Matic was is that they weren't anchored properly. And when you go push them in sometimes, they break loose and you could get shot. So, this... What year were these made? Uh, most of them were uh, put in prior to the, uh, let's say, early 80s. I'm not exact. Early 80s. Okay, so, but when you see the report, I'm just on it. You're not the guy going to do the inspection. So, you don't have to go out and know that. But if you see it in the report, be aware that there are some boxes and panels that can't be removed 
and they need an electrician, and if you do hire an electrician, ask him to check the entire electrical system. Because I'll tell you what happens. If we say that those three outlets are reverse polarity, by the way, that could be really dangerous. Reverse polarity can cause the wire to go through and anything plugged into it becomes uh, electrified, okay, in the right conditions. Don't just say go out and check those three reverse ones, ask them to do the entire system. Unless you don't care about your buyer. Okay? If you read no. Yes. Since go stop mid seventies. Thank you. I know it was in that, but she asked me for all of them and I know it's right in there. Yeah, so this might be off a little bit, but how about solar panels? Do you check all the solar yeah. things like that? We check all the things that we can check. Okay. And I'll tell you what they are. So you don't get over and on it. We check to see if the wires going to the roof are sealed against leaks. Okay. We check to see that if the brackets for the panel, visually, we don't shake it or anything, are properly secured so it won't blow off. Do we check to see if it's got the proper uh, conversion from uh, solar to the main electrical panel in the house? No, we don't do that. However, we do look to see if we can visually see if some idiot double tapped it when they made their correction because there's a way to do it right without double tapping. Now, uh, just went to a solar class a week ago Friday. I will be going to another one and we will try to get more, but that's all in the inspector. Uh, I think that kind of covers the biggest deal is don't just have an electrician come out. Just fix one outlet. Okay? And by the way, we're not in a position right now where every kitchen and every bathroom has to have a GFCI. Those that weren't, but if you have replaced a light fixture in your house, or an electrician has, but you should be held, held to the same standards as an electrician. If you have put in new three-prong outlets anywhere in your house, you were required to have upgraded your house to have GFCIs in all bathrooms, all kitchens. But not required. No, if you've never touched an electrical thing in your house, which is impossible. But if, if nothing in your house has ever been uh, changed, but is there a loss that you have to do it? No, I just said it's a good idea. Just to say I'm not on this <laughs> Yeah. The fact that there's power in your house. <laughs> <laughs> I live in a yurt. <laughs> um, attic insulation and ventilation. So we're going to check um, in un unfinished spaces, inspect the presence of attic and ventilation mechanical ventilation systems and report on the general absence or lack of insulation ventilation in unfinished spaces. Like I was saying earlier, um, a lot of times we run across when a house has been uh, renovated, they've sheetrocked right over the top of the attic access. Um, sometimes the attic access is not accessible because the um, they've had the insulation blown in and you, you can't even move that attic access at all. Um, so there's a lot of limitations to that. Sometimes we can get our inspectors up into the attic to walk around, but again, that we run into the fact that they have to be able to see what they're walking on um, and not put their foot through the ceiling of whatever's below them. So, uh, and this again is where if there was any water leaks or items like that from the roof that might be visible, um, we would be able to notice that hopefully from those kinds of things. This is where you're going to see, um, you know, a lot of the, if there's any moisture damage, things of that nature on the trusses and things like that. Do you have anything to add to that, Al? Not really, but mostly, you know, we, most inspectors are going to get up in the attic and they're going to uh, try to determine if they see any issues. One of the things I was taught when I first got into it is count every one of the trusses, count every one of the rafters. And, and I said, why? Who cares how many are there? Nobody. But if you count them, you have to look. And you'll see. 
cracks and that type of thing. Uh, attics are a challenge. Uh, insulation can be a challenge. Uh, you can go into a house that's got that nice white blown in insulation, the AD, but it was built in the 60s. And underneath that is this gray, gravelly like insulation called uh, vermiculite that has vermiculite, which you know is a cancer causing thing. And they, the whole thing was, and even the code people said, well, if you blow over it, it's fine. No, it's not, but we just can't do anything about it. It's not fine, because when you go to cut in that new hole, put that cam light in, guess what comes down? And you'll see the little gold and silver specks in it. There's just nothing we can do. We can't absolutely prove that there's vermiculite under there, because the inspector should not be changing the insulation by scraping so now knob and tube wiring some houses have knob and tube wiring still active in their attics but nobody knows it because somebody came in and blew insulation over it it's absolutely positively wrong to blow insulation over knob and tube wiring it's an extreme fire hazard but the inspector can't tell that okay and I'm going to tell you right now, if I'm an inspector, I don't want to be scraping around there seeing if I can find a live, open, knob and tube electrical connection. So we don't always know. But you know what I think is the number one telltale of knob and tube in a lot of these houses? You'll go into one of the closets. And here will be this cloth braided line coming down with the light bulb. If the light bulb operates, that means that there is at least a splice up there, maybe properly done, maybe not, into some knob and tube wire. If the light doesn't work, we just don't know. Uh, so, can an electrician go up there and do that? Yes, it's beyond the, the scope of a home inspector. And uh, if an electrician gets shot, you know my feeling on that. So, but uh, <laughs> I'm. I'm I'm really bad. I really like electrician as well. Any other questions on the app? It's the perks of their job, right? Getting shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we move on to doors, windows, and interior. So again, we're going to check a representative number of doors and windows. Um, we're going to walk around. We're going to observe the windows, the steps, the stairways, the railings. Um, make sure that, and uh, look at the balusters and spindles. Um, we're going to check the garage doors and the garage door openers for operating use and install for automatic door controls and report on improperly of any uh, photoelectric safety sensors that fail to respond uh, adequately to testing and report as in need to repair of any door locks or side ropes that have not been removed or disabled when the garage door opens um, and report as in needed. We ran into this just what, last week, I think, didn't we, with one of our inspectors? Um, go ahead and tell them about that out. Um, you, you open the garage door using the garage door deal, it opens fine. He closed the garage door, it closed fine. Then he opened it a second time and it didn't. And what happened was, it's at the, you know, on those garage doors that are on those two car garages, it will hold two matchbox cars, but not really two cars. You've seen mm -hmm. them. Uh, their one span garage door. The top panel started to buckle. Okay? He caught it immediately, put it back in place, and then with further evaluation, we found that one of the springs on the right side of the door had been broken. We were unable to determine how long it had been broken. So he called me to make sure what he wanted me to do. I ran out. I verified, looked at it, and then I called the listing agent and said, you need to call your sellers, because it was not right home. Tell them when they come home not to go through the garage door, because we don't want further damage, but the spring is broken. And it could have been broken, and it would still would have worked. But you can see the place was completely full of stories, and I could not see where they were using their garage door. Um, Who's responsible for that garage door? Sellers. 
Yeah. The inspector didn't use normal controls. Should he have to buy a new panel? Which the panel wasn't hurt that bad. And those doors almost always, if you have one of those, it's probably a good idea to go down to Home Depot, buy a couple of pieces of that angle metal, the good, the heavier stuff, and screw it across the middle of that thing. So when the day comes, it won't have you. You know why? Because right below the middle of that door is where they attach that garage door opener deal. And, and it happens a lot. Um, the, the buyers are ecstatic. Okay? They were ecstatic that that garage door failed. What do you think? That's right. It's going to be fixed before they move in. The sellers are going to hate us and all inspectors for all time. But it's just part of the business. We can't do anything about it. If, if, if an inspector turns the shower on that breaks off, okay, uh, what's the matter? Oh, open the window and we open it and it's a guillotine type window that drops down and breaks, cracks the glass. The buyers are ecstatic. The sellers hate us forever. There's just nothing we can do. Have we paid for some of those things? Absolutely, no, we shouldn't be. Really, we shouldn't be. But let's say you're our agent, and it happened to you, and we're doing an inspection for you. We're going to do everything in our power to take it from your plate. We don't want you to have to do it. But, Thermatic seals on windows. Have you ever seen windows that were had just coloring in between the glass and all that kind of stuff? That is not right, but there's a big lie out there, mostly by window contractors, that they're no longer efficient, that their energy efficiency is gone and they need to be replaced. That's generally not true. However, on the ones that have the organon gas in them, they do lose some insulation, but it doesn't. It's mostly cosmetic, but it's wrong. The seals have actually failed. Uh, getting the buyer to replace those windows if he's our seller. <laughs> Pretty good challenge, wouldn't you guys think? Yeah, On those, but uh, that's that now crack glass. If the windows are cracked, uh, FHA, VA, you got to fix those windows can't have broken glass in the house, okay? So that's another story. A little chip in the glass, which isn't nearly as ugly as that, has to be fixed. General, you guys negotiate that. Yeah. Um, and then really quick, what an inspection is not. So this is really important. So um, we're not appraisals. We don't do appraisals. Uh, we're not an FHA site inspection. We don't do building code inspections, and it's not an environmental assessment. A lot of times when you guys are doing an FHA loan, the FHA appraiser will come back out and say, these items need to be fixed um, because of the FHA standards. Um, and on a home inspection, as much as the inspector might try to point out certain items that may come up as FHA items, they don't always know what the FHA regulations are at that time. Um, so they don't always get pointed out, nor does your buyer think that they're of importance at that time. So um, we get calls back a lot saying, FHA said that the inspector should have caught this. Well, that's because the FHA appraiser, um, they're doing a different thing than we're doing as just a home inspector. And then, and that's pretty much it. So we have uh, so brought in- So do they in, do like their own inspector, like FHA? They, well, typically they, the appraiser, is the is the one that goes out and does the on-site appraisal inspection. Okay. Appraisers have a, I think it's still 27 point checklist that they go by. A couple of them are pretty important and we check them too. Do you have hot water in the house? Okay, that's a requirement. Uh, so we do that, but if you remember in the old days, you young guys don't remember that, but back in the old days you'd go and look at a uh, at home, and here you can see these two by four railing built out on the front concrete steps, uglier than all get out. They weren't even finished, they were just two by four. That's because FHA used to require a railing. 
FHA no longer has that same, but some of the old FHA appraisers will still write that up. In the inside staircase. Yes, but on the outside steps, uh, it, in some cases, yes, but they're not, they don't write them up anymore. Uh, also on an FHA, uh, they will, some of your appraisals will write up mold if they see discoloring on the shower, tile shower walls in the bathroom. Now you've read, now your underwriters are all upset. Some of them will accept our letter when we go out and say, hey, it's okay, scrubbing bubbles took care of it, it's gone. But some of them want an air test. We provide that service. Uh, it's available through our company. But the truth of the matter is FHA depends on how many years the guy's been an FHA inspector. I did go through the certification. I don't do FHA inspections, but uh, they, there's a lot of, uh, well, just inconsistency. We just leave that up to them. Yeah, but it's not the same inspection as a home inspector. Right. Yeah. Now, you guys do mold and vet testing, if you want testing but you don't clean and then. Absolutely not. You do not want somebody going out in their house telling you that you have a house full of meth or a house full of mold. And guess what? For seventy-eight thousand dollars or whatever, some of the old guys thought charge. Yeah, a thousand or some of them. Especially if they drive a big truck that has these funny initials on them. I'm not gonna see the guy. No, we wouldn't do that. Do we know how to do that? By the way, absolutely. Most home inspectors that do mold testing are not certified to, to write a protocol. For on how to clean it up. I am, but I don't. Okay? I don't like that room. Excellent. Well, don't leave me out for a minute if you have other questions and stuff. But yeah, give me a hand. I brought lunch for oh, you, too. Thank you. And I think Jolene's got, do you have plates? I do. Okay, so she'll yeah, grab some plates. But come grab some chips. And yeah. Plain plain they, um, and if you have other questions, please yeah. yeah. ask your questions. How are you? I do. Now, our company does have a. So they were. They lost did you get a coffee? Yeah, we had more heat. But um, what was really bad is that we had this things like a Tesco baby or baby I one of them